approximately 45 minutes and will be recorded. For the benefit of everyone, the conference line has been muted for all participants. We will open up for questions in the last 10 minutes where you can submit your questions via the questions pane on your control panel. Please note, if you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them at any time and they will be answered at the end. <coughs> Dr. Tioma Niemenen is a Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Helsinki and Chief Physician of Internal Medicine at the Hospital District of South Karelia and Helsinki University Centre Hospital. Dr. Niemenen obtained his Doctor of Medicine at the University of Tampere in 2005 and became a certified clinical investigator within a year. By 2006, he was Assistant Professor, Senior Lecturer, Clinical Pharmacology, University of Tampere and began his residency for internal medicine training. He has been an editorial board member of three mm -hmm. journals and held memberships in various cardiac scientific societies. He also served as the chairman of the board in two companies operating in the nursing care business. Thank you so much for your time to today, Dr. Niemenen, and I'll now hand the webinar over to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lian, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we will talk about a T-Web alternance, which is a marker to predict who, will, who is prone to have a sudden cardiac death in the future. So the first session we had, it was about sudden cardiac death in general, and the previous time it was about these risk factors, risk markers, and now we will more specifically talk one of them, one of the most promising ones. So just as a short reminder about the, about the last time, so basically why we need more these risk mark markers is the fact that while most of the people have very low risk of having sudden cardiac death, uh, they have, because there are so many of these low risk people, as a total their combined risk is very high and they many of them suffer sudden cardiac death a year. And if we are talking about risk markers or stratifiers, an ideal one would be to possibly to combine several individual markers so that we could lift uh, risk from low to high for certain people and possibly also that if we think some person is high risk so that we could lower his or her individual risk to the low level. So as a very, very short beginning of the TV alternance, it reflects the repolarization phase of the electric cycle of the heart and it's determined from digital ECG Sometimes it's even visible to naked eye, but most typically it's it's a tiny phenomenon that one needs to have a digital ECG with software. And basically what it means, well, what alternance means is that there's a pattern which alternates between two different uh, options or dif two different patterns. And it's, for, it's if we have a uh, uh, a here, A pattern and B pattern, then we have A, B, A, B, and it's evident in the ST segment and T wave of the ECHC. As you, as you know, as is this peak, peak phase of the ECG QRS complex, it's about the depolarization phase of the heart, of the left ventricle to be more, more specific, and then this here is about the repolarization phase when the heart returns to its uh, basic base level. And this is very essential in the light of many ventricular arrhythmias because if this is unstable, which means that it's a little bit different in different parts of the heart or it's a little bit different when the time goes on, then this predisposes to ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation. And very much is known about the mechanisms and I will very shortly discuss those also. And what it, what it means here, and we have A, B, A, B, which might be very difficult for an eight eye as I mentioned, but if you, if you take a look at very closely here, this B goes on a slightly above the A pattern. 
basically QR is complex, it's equal, but then the, uh, these A and B patterns of the repolarization phase are a little bit different. So this here, this is alternance because it's in A, B, A, B type of pattern, but then this lower ECG here, this is not alternance because it's not A, B, A, B, this might be something else, this is A, B, C, A, B, something else, so it's not an alternating pattern. So basically there are many different types of variability of the ST segment and T wave, but this alternance is a specific phenomenon. It has been known actually a hundred years, or known by some very few people, that there is alternance, so Professor Herring from Germany already recognized the phenomenon. And along the decades, it was known that under certain conditions, T wave alternance can be very visible, for example, in patients with long QT interval, which is very often genetic, but also can be caused by certain drugs. And if, we, if you take a look at here, so this is the repolarization phase, ST segment and T wave, this is uh, clearly A, B, A, B type of pattern here. Uh, it is published in 75. And also, it has been known that if there's a myocardial ischemia, then it's possible to have um, visible T wave alternance or macroscopic alternance, as it's also called. Basically, if we take a very quick look how ECG here is composed or generated, it's a sum, it's a, it, uh, it's a combination of all the activities within a heart, and if we take a look at certain place of the heart, for example here at the end of the peak or apex of the left ventricle, we would see electrical activity like shown here, and all these combined will be regular ECG. And now, if we have T wave alternance like here, then if we have an electrode within a heart or specifically on the on the certain place of the heart, then we would have alternance something like this, and this would be called action potential alternance, and it's a, a similar phenomenon to T wave alternance because T wave alternance is just what we see on a on a uh, kind of larger electrodes which always combine more information from different areas. And what is also important here is that alternance occurs on a level of each cardiac myocytes. So it means that there is something happening within a cardiac myocyte. And what is happening here is that the calcium handling Calcium is one of the most important uh, ions uh, within within heart, and it goes back and forth to the cytosol of the cell, and then it, it's always pumped back to uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum and also out of the cell. And if either the uh, loading back uh, to calcium to uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum if it's uh, defected or if the release of the calcium to the cytosol is deficient or to, if it happens too much, then that is also one reason why there might be alternance, alternating pattern in the calcium level. And very interestingly, it is called circa tube A, this molecule which pumps the calcium back to sarcoplasmic reticulum, and if uh, this uh, pump is enhanced, for example, if there's a, like here in a guinea pig model, they, they have additional circuit to A uh, genes, <clears throat> so that there definitely is enough or even too much, too many circuit to A pumps, then this inhibits alternance of the calcium, and also it inhibits action potential alternance, and these uh, these animals are very resistant to get ventricular fibrillation. <clears throat> and specific, uh, particularly 
if the alternance goes so that it's a little bit different in different parts of the heart, then that type of heart is very, very close to getting, uh, getting ventricular fibrillation. And I, I have here, um, uh, actually I had a video, but then that type of videos, they are not functional uh, over this, uh, this um, connection. So I took screenshots of what alternance shows, looks like in the kind of a real life. This is a peak, so, and we have the electrodes on the heart, and these are left on the left ventricle, and these are right ventricle. We are mostly interested on these electrodes, which are on the left ventricle. And as you can see here, the ST segment is elevated in comparison to baseline level in all of all three electrodes here or leads. And it's because uh, we had occluded the coronary artery of this uh, anesthetized uh, peak. But here you can see the ST segment of TV, they are very similar. Uh, in each of these complexes. So there is no ABAB type of pattern at this phase. So, but when, when times go a, a few seconds further, okay, again, we are not seeing clear alternance yet. Okay, a few more seconds. And now you, yeah, now you will see this is clearly elevated in comparison to this one here. So this is A pattern, B, a, B, and the same is true here, A, B, A, B, so this is clearly alternating, there's T-wave alternance because of the ischemia here, and when, <clears throat> when this uh, continues for 15 seconds or so, it becomes more marked, as you can see here, then at the end of this 20 second period or so, the, it goes, the heart goes to ventricular fibrillation, which is a chaotic, totally chaotic and lethal heart rhythm. As you, as you can see here, this is the ventricular fibrillation. And <clears throat> what happens in VF is that there are many different uh, kind of activities going on all the time in the ventricles, and it's not synchronized as it is in normal rhythm when the signal comes and it it's uh, dispersed and then it dies out uh, and waiting for the next impulse. But in ventricular fibrillation, it goes all the time around erratically the uh, ventricles and pump function does not work. The next time, that, well, I mean, the next piece of the presentation is that I will talk about the methodology, how to, how to measure T-wave alternance. There are different different approaches, and I will present uh, two of those <coughs> because they are clearly the most important ones. The one is the so-called spectral method, which is based on very sophisticated mathematics, so that uh, they can extract alternance uh, from uh, from an exercise test. Unfortunately, this method requires very stable heart rate. So that there's a treadmill test, and the heart rate is stabilized uh, to, to the level of between 105 and 110, and then with fast Fourier transform, they will they will get the alternance. And this method here, this requires specific equipment, and then the other method, it's a uh, the approach is totally different. And it's, it might be a little bit easier uh, to comprehend how it how it's handled. We have here, it's called modified moving average method. It's so-called time domain method in comparison to the spectral method of the previous slide. So we have here A, B, A, B, A, B. And then these beads are classified. The A ones go to this bin here and the B beads go here and they, all of these A's they are averaged and then the B's are averaged and at that place they are compared and what is um, different between the A's and B's this is called the alternance of course 
This is also done uh, totally auto uh, automatically, this process itself, uh, but it doesn't require any specific uh, equipment. It's uh, a software module. And this can be extracted from clinical exercise tests with just normal, regular uh, protocols. And also, this can be taken out of, for example, halter data. <coughs> So about the predictivity, there has been many, many studies about alternance, clearly more than 100 different studies. The spectral method, uh, they have more studies here, but the, with the modified moving average, there has been clearly more than 6,000 patients already. And many meta-analyses combining the data from the, uh, from the previous studies have been done for the spectral method and also at least one meta-analysis for the modified moving average method also. And I will show you the main points uh, about this evidence. <clears throat> about the spectral method, I will handle the methods differently. Uh, well, no, in the same way, but, uh, but so that I will not combine the data because the systems are different and it's it's uh, in that way, it's better to handle them in different in different analyses. <clears throat> so this is one analysis, meta-analysis of the spectral method, and they combined here all the studies where they had at least 100 patients, and so that a few of the patients had an ICD. So if the, and if the some of the patients had an ICD, that person was excluded. This might uh, sounds strange, but it's because if the patient has an ICD, it is very difficult to uh, say or know whether he or she would suffer a sudden cardiac death because the ICD prevents sudden cardiac death. And then they had almost uh, 3,000 patients in this combination analysis. They had uh, mostly ischemic cardiomyopathy, which basically means that they had coronary heart disease or coronary heart ejection fraction. It was on the average 44 percent and 50 is normal, so it was on the average a little bit low, but not uh, definitely not very much, so these patients were in quite good shape. <clears throat> so. What happens in the spectral method, there are always, they, they say that the test is either negative or it's positive or it's indeterminate. So, for example, in this analysis, about 15% of the patients, they had in test results and they don't give values what it means to be, uh, if one is POC is clearly positive or Okay, but 30% were positive. And with these results, risk than having a positive test. And uh, okay, and well, there are different types and different types of patient groups. If the ejection fraction was low, uh, if low, it was clearly the same result as in the entire population here. So what the results suggested that if the patient had a negative T wave alternance, so is there a need for an ICD even though the ejection fraction would be low? There are some negative studies also, of course. I have listed here uh, two of them and uh, two main ones. And these, these here, they have raised some controversy. But there are several explanations why uh, why these are negative. One reason is that these studies used an ICD shock, 
uh, as an endpoint, even though we know very well that then if the ICD gives a shock, it's not an equivalent to a sudden cardiac death, and even 90% of the endpoints were ICD shocks. And there were some other, other discussions, discussions also about the possible reasons behind. <clears throat> and this here, this is a very interesting uh, brand new study. They, this study, they combined uh, data from eight centers from Japan and Europe where spectral alternance had been used to decide whether a person with low ejection fraction, whether he or she received on ICD. So basically, they took uh, such uh, studies, uh, eight studies, but such that they were, uh, they selected those eight studies so that they all of, all of them had a very uh, clear, def, uh, uh, they had demonstrated that in those data, alternates had been used in the decision making process. And each extra fraction was low because if it wasn't low, then ICD would have been considered in the first place. Basically, they had here about 550, uh, 650 patients, about 62, 63 year old, mostly. They are male, as in most cardiovascular studies, male, males are clearly more prevalent. Each section fraction was about 30% here. And importantly, if the alternance, if it was <coughs> If it was negative, only 13% of these patients had an ICD. And if the alternance was indeterminate or positive, then 62% had an ICD. And if we take a look at how these uh, different groups uh, survived, so uh, a long time, this is about eight years here, if the alternance was negative, they had a better prognosis than the non-negative ones, even though these patients with the negative alternance, they did not have the ICD. So these patients with non-negative alternance, many of them, above 60% of them had an ICD, but non -with notwithstanding that, the ICD could not lift their prognosis to the same level as the people here with the negative alternance. <coughs> So about the modified moving average, and first I will show results from our own study with the routine clinically indicated exercise test. This was our first um, paper on this uh, topic, and we had at that point about 1,000 patients. Uh, at the end of the study, we had closer to 4,000, and I will show a little bit later some results of that study also. Mostly, the exercise test, it was done because of suspicion of coronary heart disease. And then, if the alternance, if it was abnormal, it was elevated, these patients had about five times risk of those with normal T-wave alternance in the course of a few years follow-up. <coughs> and then there's a question whether small alternance is different than larger alternance, and these are also based on our own studies. This here was done in collaboration with a group from Canada, Calgary, and both of our studies here showed that if the alternance goes higher, the incidence or risk of death also is elevated, and this is true for cardiovascular mortality sudden cardiac death, and also the blue bars here, total mortality. And then, <clears throat> this is our latest study about, about alternance. Uh, we had uh, T-wave alternance, and also we had heart rate recovery and metabolic equivalence, which I shortly talked about the previous session. Uh, if none of these three markers was abnormal, then the patient had a very good prognosis. But the prognosis clearly went poor if one, two, or three of the markers were, deep, uh, were abnormal. And this has been shown also in some other studies that combination 
of tabular alternance with some other parameters might be beneficial. And I have an example here. This is also our own own paper that <clears throat> there's a patient a patient with a very uh, rapid rise in heart rate when he exercises. Met is high even 11, and then in the recovery phase, the, beat, the heart rate goes down very quickly, which means that heart rate recovery is high, and also the patient did not have any alternance. But here, another patient had alternance, low met, and low heart rate recovery, and this patient died, died shortly after the exercise test while this upper person did not. <clears throat> and then there's a study about alternance, modified moving average alternance in, uh, in Holter studies. And this is a Japanese study. And they had uh, 295 patients with left ventricle dysfunction, which basically means that the ejection fraction was lower. It was not as good as it should have been. And if the alternance was positive, the risk of death was clearly higher, even 16 times as high as for those without alternance. It's very dramatic result. And about the meta-analysis of the MMA method, and this is, this is of the Halter results or ambulatory ECG. And there are five such studies completed so far uh, with different uh, populations and so. And the ejection fraction in, it, was, it has been quite good actually. So these patients, they haven't been very sick uh, regarding congestive heart failure. And this is the summary of the results. Basically, of course, the risk ratios, it varies from a study to another, but as a combination, it's about six times risk if a person has elevated alternance. And <clears throat> so something what is missing is uh, a study which would be prospective uh, and having ICD implanted uh, clearly on the basis of what the alternance level is. And now there's an ongoing such a study with this refined ICD and it's a very landmark study. Unfortunately, it will still take several years before it's completed. And there are more than 100 centers around the world who are participating and we are also a part of this study. And it's led by Derek Exner from Calgary. And the hypothesis here is that if there's a person who has survived myocardial infarction and the ejection fraction of the left ventricle is a little bit low from 36 to 50, so it means that these patients, they are not eligible to get an ICD uh, only based on ejection fraction, but also heart rate turbulence, which is a marker of parasympathetic and sympathetic activity, and also T-wave alternance, they are taken from a halter, and if heart rate turbulence and alternance, if they both are abnormal, then uh, these patients might benefit of an ICD. So this is the hypothesis. And the aim is to get as many as uh, 1,400 people here. Basically, what is done in the study, many, a lot of patients are screened so that the ejection fraction needs to be in the specific, specified uh, interval here. And a halter is done. And if both alternance and turbulence are abnormal, then the study goes on for the patient. And randomly, randomly he or she is allocated either to receive ICD or to be in the control group. And the follow-up will be five years. So we will, we will need to wait several more years before we know the results, but this will be a very, very extremely important study. So a few years ago, we published a, 
uh, guideline or international consensus document about alternance and uh, we concluded there that T wave alternance it's a it's a risk clearly it's a risk marker and it's it reasonable to consider T wave alternance measurements if there's a suspicion of uh, vulnerability to lethal cardiac arrhythmias which basically means cardiac tachycardia or ventricular. But then, at the end of the day, we don't have uh, enough evidence how, about how much alternance should guide a therapy. I showed one study where there's a suggestion that alternance uh, would be useful, and then this refined ICD, it will be a very remarkable study in this sense. So, the summary, the presentation, alternance it's a parameter of heterogeneity of the cardiac repolarization, which means that it's a marker of whether repolarization is stable or unstable. And this whether it's if it's unstable, then the person is prone to have a ventricular fibrillation. And this alternance as a phenomenon, it's a very uh, specific and it's a it's a clear phenomenon but we have some technical or let's say it's a the challenge is whether we can reliably detect alternance from the surface electrodes there are some methods as i presented how it's possible to to be done and the predictivity studies there are many of those they are they are very promising uh, and we are waiting a randomized prospective treatment trial which is ongoing at, uh, at the moment. But then I will also need to say that such a study like a refined ICD, it's not uh, available, such studies are not available to basically any of the ECG markers. So in this sense, T-Web alternance is at the very forefront of ECG uh, research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nieminen. I'll now open the floor up for any questions you may have. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A window. I have a question that was submitted earlier in the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, PVC biogemical rhythm, can this be used to measure TWA? Uh, by Gemini. Well, actually, no, because in that uh, in that case, the QRS complex it's alternating, so it's definitely clear that in such a case there is alternance, but it's not because of the repolarization phase itself, but it's because the depolarization phase uh, is different from A to B. So basically, we we don't want to see many ventricular ectopies when we are measuring alternance. Okay, thank you, doctor. Uh, another question: You presented that stress testing is used for TWA measurement in both methods. Is a higher mm -hmm. heart rate necessary for a definitive TWA analysis? Uh, Pardon, can you please repeat? There's some, some trouble with the connection. Can you please oh, repeat the sorry, question? Yeah. You presented that stress testing is used for TWA measurement in both methods. Yes. Is a higher uh -huh. heart rate necessary for a definitive TWA analysis? Ah, okay. If the heart rate needs to be elevated, is that the question? So, uh, wait. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, with the spectrum method, they definitely need elevated alternance. They have standardized the system uh, so that the heart rate needs to be between 105 and 110. And I mentioned that there are certain patients with indeterminate test result, and most of those are indeterminate exactly because heart rate does not go uh, doesn't go up enough. For example, here in adequate heart rate, these are the patients which don't have enough, uh, well, high enough heart rate. But when we are talking about this modified moving average, 
then we can measure the alternance at whatever heart rate. But naturally, because the calcium handling is dependent on the heart rate, it's more probable to see alternance if the heart rate is higher than what it is in the normal resting phase. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, what TWA method is being used in the refined ICD study? And why oh, is that preferable? Yeah, very good question. Yes, very good question also. Uh, so, uh, modify moving average method is used in the refined ICD. And the history of refined ICD is that Derek Exner with his uh, group, they had a refined study about uh, almost a decade ago. They published the first results 2007. And in that study, they, they studied many non-invasive risk markers and only two of them proved to be predictive of uh, sudden cardiac death and they were alternance with this modified moving average method and heart rate turbulence. That's why those two have been taken to the refined ICD study. Okay, thank you Dr. Niemann. If there are no further questions, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and thank you again, uh, Doctor, for, for the presentation. We hope you yeah. enjoy the remainder of your day. Yeah, thank you. The same to you, all of you. Thank you.